Sunday is that special time for us to get together and study the Word of God. We're so glad that you've joined us this morning for our presentation of Give Me the Bible. So go get your Bible, sit down, and let's study together from the pages of God's eternal Word right here on Give Me the Bible. Good morning once again, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for tuning in to this edition of Give Me the Bible. I am proud to be here for you. My name is Joe Hancock, and I'll be your host this morning as we go once again into God's Word. Uh, have you heard that God doesn't have a, a propensity to be a respecter of persons? And if you've heard that, do you understand really what that's about? Uh, God is no respecter of persons. If you go into Scripture just really quick, and if you want to write these down, you can. Uh, Acts chapter 10, verses 34, 35. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 9. Colossians 3, 25. And 1 Peter 1, 17. What do they all have in common? They all make the claim that God is no respecter of persons. So we need to understand what that means. Have you guessed that's what this program is about this morning? The fact that God is no respecter of persons. So we're going to start with our brother Dan Manuel this morning. Dan... If God is no respecter of persons, does that mean that he treats us all the same way? And in speaking of his law, does that mean even if I'm not a Christian, I'm still responsible to understand and obey his law? Well, to your question, Joe, absolutely you're amenable to the law of God, whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian. Now, we have a lot of people today that are advocates of what we call predestination, the idea that uh, you're born to either live eternally in hell or you're born to live eternally in heaven. And if that were the case, and that would make God a respecter of persons. But going back to that particular passage in the book of Acts chapter 10, uh, when Peter's speaking to Cornelius, he says, uh, But God in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness with him is accepted of him. God wants us all to work righteousness. Uh, you know, through the uh, dispensations of time, there have been basically what we call uh, three dispensations, one being that patriarchal law where God actually spoke to the heads of families, uh, the husband, and then there is what we call the Mosaic law, the law that came uh, through Moses, and then what we have the Christian age uh, certainly is based upon the biblical teachings of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Well, we know that uh, we're all amenable to that law of Jesus today. Christ took the old law out of the way, nailing it to the cross, Colossians chapter 2, verse 12 and following. We know that we're not under a patriarchal law today, but the law of Jesus Christ supersedes them all. For the Bible says, God, who in sundry and divers manners in times past spake unto the fathers, times past spake unto the fathers by the prophets, but he hath, he hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, Jesus Christ, whom he hath appointed to be heir of all things. So we know that uh, we are under the law of Jesus Christ. Uh, it's not a tyrannical law. Uh, it is a law uh, that uh, really supersedes any of the other laws that were given. You know, when you read the Old Testament, you understand the law was consistently made up of five books of the Old Testament. It was Genesis, Exodus, Viticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That was the old law. But then we also read the, the books of Proverbs, Psalms. That's not part of the old law. The old law consisted of the old law, <laughs> But we live under the New Testament. I preach many things in the book of Psalms that are consistent even with the teaching of Christ. And I think it's interesting when you read the teaching of Jesus, how many quotes he takes from the book of Psalms. It's amazing to me. But we are under the law of Christ. And that's why we all have to do the same thing in order to please Almighty God. And you're going to hear more about that momentarily, Joe. Dan, you're right, and then appreciate your words this morning. Yeah, see, folks, everybody's under the same law. Whether you're Christian, whether you believe or not, 
our opinions don't matter. God has set the law. Just like if, if I'm driving out on I-20 and I happen to be going 80 miles an hour because that's what I want to do and I'm from somewhere else, maybe another country, and I'm driving through the state of Texas on vacation and I break the law, I'm still guilty no matter where I come from. No matter where our position is on God, we're still under that Christian law, the law of Christ. Jerry Monholland's going to go a little further, and we talk about that, that law and, and, and all men being amenable or responsible to the law. Well, what about salvation in that respect, Jerry? Well, Joe, that brings up a great question. As Brother Dan has pointed out, that Christ has a law which must be obeyed. And as our Brother Joe pointed out, that all men must obey that law. And as we read about the salvation and we read in Colossians chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, uh, this was a mystery to the people, and Paul reveals that mystery of who it is that the law is applied to. Now listen to what he says. Even the mystery which we have been hid from ages, from generation, is now made manifest to his saints. And so now Paul is saying, I'm going to give you the secret, reveal the secret of the mystery of the gospel. And here it is in verse 27. Are you listening? He said, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now we understand throughout the old law, the Old Testament, as Brother Dad had said, the Jews were amenable to that. And now the mystery of the gospel of Christ is that the Gentiles also shall obey the gospel or have the opportunity to obey the gospel or must obey the gospel because it is that we all have a sin problem. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He didn't say that some have sinned, most have sinned. He said all have sinned. When we sin, we have a sin problem because we separate ourselves from God. We, and we need salvation to bring us back to God. Who has separated himself from God? All have sinned. In Romans chapter 3, verse 10, it said, There is none righteous, no, not one. That every one of us needs salvation because every one of us have sinned. And so, praise God, he said in Titus chapter 2, verse 11, that the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. The grace of God. Grace. We're saved by grace. That grace has appeared to all men. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9 says that Jesus on the cross tasted death for every man. The grace of God that brings salvation is Jesus upon the cross. And he tasted that death for all all men. And John 3.16 says, For whosoever, whoever believes. Oh, isn't that a wonderful imitation? Whosoever will has opportunity for everlasting life. Have you obeyed the gospel? If not, why not? Fair questions, Jerry. Thank you, sir. We appreciate you being with us this morning. And folks, he's, he's got a valid question for you. Have you obeyed the gospel or not? Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe God is no respecter of persons, that he doesn't treat one different from the other? That salvation has been provided for everybody, no matter who you are. That's scriptural truth. Barry Haynes is our next panelist this morning. Barry, what about when we talk about salvation... Are there different stipulations or different conditions from one person to the next, or is that all the same as well? Well, you know, there are conditions that come to salvation, the conditions that God spells out in order to receive salvation, but they are not different conditions for different people. One of the most important points that we need to, to have in our minds and our understanding about God is that Salvation isn't something that is offered arbitrarily to different people at different times. In other words, God will say, I'll save this person over here this way, and I'll save this person over here this way. This person, I'll hold accountable for this sin. This person, uh, I, I will not. God has a system. He, he doesn't arbitrarily do that. There is a plan of salvation. There are conditions 
for salvation. If that were the case, then, then all men would be saved because God is forgiving. But God has told us what we must do to be saved. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, we see that uh, when Peter was sent to Cornelius, we know that Peter was not expecting to go to someone like Cornelius simply because Cornelius was a Gentile. But when he gets there and he sees that God has brought salvation to his household, he recognizes that God is no respecter of persons, that, that in every nation those that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted by him. We may have limitations when it comes to other people. We may look at someone and say, well, they're not worthy to be saved because maybe we have a racist idea of, of where they come from or we have a, a, a grudge against uh, their family or people. But God doesn't work that way. But conversely, we need to also realize that when it comes to salvation, we cannot assume that we will get in in another way. We can't look and say, well, because I had a good family background, then I'll be saved. Because God does not arbitrarily deselect it because of who your grandparents were or who your parents were. It is what you have done to respond to the conditions that he sets forth to us. Jesus has told us, what we must do to be saved. Jesus says, unless you believe that I am he, he tells us that we must repent of our sins. He tells us that if we confess him before uh, uh, men, he'll confess us before the Father. Jesus says, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. These are his conditions. These are what he's told us we must do to be saved. And we can't think, well, I've been a good enough person that he'll make the exception for me. It's almost like a a person going to that exclusive event or something and, and the tickets are all sold out, but they walk up and say, well, I know somebody or, or I, I have a lot of money or I have this, I, that, that'll get me in. God doesn't work that way. He doesn't care who you are. He doesn't care who your folks were. He doesn't care how much money you have. What he does care about is if you have listened to him and obeyed the conditions that he set forth. When we come before God, we don't have anything to offer him. The only thing that we can offer him is our faithful obedience that we listen to him and understand that he's a loving God that wants to save. Barry, that he is, my friend. Thank you so much. You know, you were speaking about uh, the, uh, this idea of, of some say that, I, well, I'll, I'll do salvation this way, and others say, well, I'll do, I'll do salvation this way, and somebody else says, I'll do salvation this way. I'm thinking the whole time you were speaking that that sounds very, very similar to what we know as denominationalism. And you're saying that that is not agreeing with what God has set as his standard for salvation for all men. That's something to think about. My brother James is here. James Bivens is with us this morning. And James, since we've, we're gone this far, uh, salvation means that we're in Christ. We are, we are centered in Christ. We are, we are part of the body of Christ. Is, is, does God have the, in mind the same body of Christ? For all men or, or different bodies? Explain that to us, if you would, so folks will know. Thank you, Brother Joe. And yes, it sure is. Just as we've seen this morning, there's the same law, the same salvation, and the same conditions. He also has a common church for all men. Jesus promised to build his church. Matthew 16, 18 and 19 says, And I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever shall be bound on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever shall loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So the establishment of Jesus' church was very important because in Christ we have redemption and spiritual blessings. Let's, let's listen to several scriptures here and listen to these beautiful blessings. Ephesians 1, starting in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places through Christ, according as he hath chosen us and him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blemish before him in love, having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and glory of his grace wherein he made us acceptable in the beloved. Now listen to this verse. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. In Ephesians 2.16, we see that Jesus' church is for all. In biblical times, like it's already been mentioned in other programs, Jews and Gentiles were the whole world. He says there, and that he might reconcile both God in one body through the cross, having slain the enemy thereby. 
All who are scripturally baptized are placed into Jesus' church or the body. Galatians 3.26, For ye are all the children of God in faith through Jesus Christ, for as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Acts 2 and 47, Praising God and having favor with all the people, the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. 1 Corinthians 12 and 13, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether it be Jew or Gentile, whether it be bond or free, and we've all been made to drink into one Spirit. Ephesians 1, starting in verse 22, And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him the head over all the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fulfilleth all in all. Hence there is one body. Ephesians 4, 4 tells us, There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called into the hope of your calling. Colossians 1 and 18, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. And finally, here on Give Me the Bible, we tell you the truth and nothing but the truth. Acts 4.12 tells us this, Neither is there salvation in any other name, for there is no other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Are you in Christ this morning? Back to you, Joe. James, thank you so much, brother. And, you know, James asked a fair question this morning. Are you in Christ? And, folks, there is only one way. You, you can't. The scriptures don't give us any ability or any permission to, to try to be in Christ in the way we think is, is okay. Uh, and again, back to that idea of denominationalism. Everybody talks about getting into Christ a different way. They teach about the doctrine being different. Put that, all that down and just pick up the scriptures. What has God had to say about how to be obedient to the gospel, what the gospel is, as salvation, but there's a more important point I think we need to address before we go this morning, and that's with Chris Grota about the judgment factor. I said, Chris, is God going to judge everyone on the same basis, or are there, is it different for different people? Answer that for us, will you? Well, of course, the Bible says that God is going to use the same standard, and that's all part of the gospel teaching. Not everybody's going to believe that, but... When the judgment day gets here, that, that will be determined or that will be confirmed, I guess you would say. Hebrews 9, 27 says that it's appointed unto man to die once and then after this comes the judgment. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 and 10 that uh, we're all going to be standing before Christ at his judgment seat. And Paul said to that group of people out there in, uh, on Mars Hill in Athens, um, he said of all that, those idolaters, he said, you know, the, the times of this ignorance, God winked at. He, he tolerated it once upon a time, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day in, on which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained and has given us assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And so it leaves nothing to the imagination that God will judge the world by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ will be the judge, but only in the accommodative sense because God is going to do it through Jesus. And um, what we see here is that um, is not only the person who's going to exact the judgment, but we also know that he's going to use a standard of judgment. In John 12 and verse number 48, Jesus said, He that rejects me and receives not my word has one that judges him. The word I have spoken the same will judge him in the last day. If you were a Jew and you lived under the Old Testament law, you were judged by the law of Moses. But since the law of Moses has been abolished and Christ has established the New Testament, it is that New Testament, is that new law that is going to judge us in the last day. Jesus Christ will be the judge and his word will be the standard of that judgment. That means this, that we are not going to be judged by our feelings, opinions, or personal beliefs. We're not going to be judged by our family. We're not going to be judged by our friends or our co-workers. We're not even going to be judged by our elders, teachers, or preachers. We're not going to be judged by denominational councils or synods or, or conferences or single congregations. We're not going to be appealing to a confession of faith, a catechism, or a creed book. We're not even going to be judged by Google, Facebook, or artificial intelligence. We are going to be judged by Jesus Christ and His Word 
And that is the promise that is made in Scripture. That is the incentive and that we have to be right with God. And people are testing religions all the time. And more and more people are coming to faith in Jesus Christ. My friends, if you are sitting on the fence, please jump over and get on the Lord's side before it's everlastingly too late. Great advice, Chris. Great advice. I don't know if you had any better advice given out this morning at all. <laughs> Folks, you need to be in Christ. Is, is, that's all there is to it. That's all there is to it before it's eternally too late. Now, Scout Betts is our final panelist this morning. And Scout, you know, Jesus, Eve, we can do all the teaching and preaching we want to do, I think. And, and, and the end result, the final analysis, hasn't Jesus given us the end result already or a good idea about the end result of all this? In, in Matthew and in other places where he talks about that narrow gate and that wide way to eternity. Uh, you, want, you want to talk to us about that? When we think about what Jesus says concerning those who will follow him and those who choose not to, we'll sum it up this way. On the day of judgment, some will be saved and some will be lost. Although Jesus died for all men and salvation is for all and we all live under the same law, not all will be saved. And you say, well, well, preacher, how can that make sense? Let me ask you this. If you got a phone call and a caller ID popped up and you didn't recognize the number, what do you choose to do in that moment? Your choice is answer it or not answer it. Many today receive the caller ID of God, but they don't recognize who he is. And though everyone receives that phone call, many will not answer it. Some will be saved and some will be lost. Jesus is going to say himself in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. If I were to stand before you and say, well, some are going to be saved and some are going to be lost, I hold no weight. I am just a man. But if we were to open up God's word together, his inspired word, and let Jesus speak to us through that word, would you listen? Are you listening? Because that's what we're looking at this morning is the word of God inspired for us to see. So how do we know who will be saved and who will be lost? In John chapter 5 verses 28 through 29, do not marvel at this, it reads, for the hour is coming which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Two groups of people, then the question becomes, which one do I fall in? Which category am I in? Which group am I in? Are you part of those who do the will of the Father? Heaven has no limit of spots available. All who are faithful will be there. So then the final question we want to leave with is, will I be counted as faithful and saved, or am I going to be counted as lawless and lost. The choice is yours, and the answer is in God's Word. Scott, thank you so much, brother, and, and once again, thanks to all the panelists who've done a wonderful job this morning in, in talking to us about this idea of God not being a respecter of persons. I mean, he's not going to treat anybody any different than anybody else, and that's, that's great, except for those who choose not to believe they'll be treated like anybody else who chooses not to believe. You know, a lot of belief has to do with what truth you have heard. You know, there's a lot of semblances of truth, some, some truths that are similar to the real truth of God's Word. Uh, isn't it better to know God's Word than hearsay or something that some man said because that's what he thought? He didn't tell you that's just what he thought. He just preached it and, you know, there's a DVD that a lot of folks have had a lot of benefit from over the years. It's called Searching for Truth. And Brother John Moore does a really, really great job narrating through the scriptures. And it's, it's all biblically based. I believe he uses New Testament scripture. I'm not 100% sure, but I think that's right. 
uh, as far as uh, New King James. But if you'd like to have one of these for you or for a friend, give us a call, let us know. We'll send it out to you postpaid, no charge for the DVD. Uh, we just want you to have it and get to some knowledge of the truth if you're ha having questions about uh, such things as baptism, the house of God, the church, the creator, uh, the truth, period. Uh, those things are, are, like I said, well done and well, well versed on this scripture based DVD. Thank you for being with us this morning. Uh, again, I'm Joe Hancock, and it's been my privilege and pleasure to be your host. If you have questions or topics you'd like for us to comment on or study on, uh, be sure and let us know. Uh, you can uh, send message to us, either by the information that you see on the screen from time to time this morning, or just give us a phone call at that 800 number. Again, thanks for being with us. Call a friend. Let them know we're, going, we're here every Sunday morning, Lord willing, unless we're preempted by a certain special or un uninterrupted event. And we look forward to seeing you here next time right here. On Give Me the Bible. Until then, God bless. Sing the sweetest song of all.